Okay, uh, welcome to Princeton, welcome to the Institute. Uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Um, and this is a talk based on some work that uh, we are, we're working on, it hasn't appeared in the archive yet. And first let me give you some very general motivations. Um, so I'd like to point out some problems and some issues. That so one, uh, one question that we would like to understand is to understand better uh, classical field theories. Um, so classically, classical weakly coupled, so, so classical, by classical I mean weakly coupled field theories, uh, that then we'll take this classical theorem, quantize it, and with a very small coupling. Um, and uh, the question is what are the possible Lagrangians, what are the possible classical uh, equations we can write for these theories and classical action. And in particular, this problem for particles with spin is uh, quite non-trivial. Uh, in fact, you're all familiar with the fact that uh, with spin one and spin two, to lead in order in derivatives, the action is uniquely specified. Um, so that uh, shows the problem is quite interesting. And um, this problem can be studied in various ways. Uh, you can try to write down classical Lagrangians and then check that they lead to a unitary field theory. Um, or uh, you can think about uh, on-shell amplitudes and demand that they are unitary and crossing symmetric and Lorentz invariant. Um, now there are some questions which are in this uh, type of category. Um, so the first question is, uh, what is the most general form of a pure gravity theory? So imagine you have a theory that contains only massless gravitons. Um, and if we restrict to leading order in derivatives, then we have the Einstein theory. But imagine there are higher derivative corrections, which are still important in the classical regime. I let, later, we'll, we'll see what this means in practice, but uh, that are still important. So what kind of higher derivative corrections can we have and still have a well-defined uh, classical theory? This is a question whose answer we don't, uh, we don't quite know. You can certainly write uh, actions like that contain the Einstein term, so square root of gr, and perhaps some r square corrections. And those are some classical actions. Some of these actions have uh, problems with ghosts that lead to particles which have a negative norm. Uh, some, other, some other actions don't have this problem. So for example, there's a popular one which is called the gauss bonnet action, which contains the, um, the Einstein term plus a particular r square term, and that, uh, seems fine in terms of uh, quantizing the theory around flat space or around uh, any curved background, which is a solution of the equations. Um, so that's an example of a theory. Um, but we don't know what the, the general constraints are. And in some, some of those theories have problems around uh, specific backgrounds, but the, there we don't know whether the problem is with the background or with the theory itself. Another question we can ask, which is a close relative, is what is the most general form of a classical gravity theory, which can contain mass equal to zero gravitons, but also maybe massive higher spin particles? So that's some other theory we would like to understand. Um, string theory is a, is a version of this. It's a particular solution to this question. Uh, but we'd like to understand what uh, the, the general uh, answer to this question is, is there an answer which is not string theory, for example, um, of this question? Um, and a closely related question is, what's the general classical theory for interacting massive higher spin particles? Um, for example, uh, the type of theory we get if we have large n QCD. So in the large n approximation, the, the coupling between, um, well, in the large n approximation, we expect to have glue balls and that these glue balls are weakly coupled, have a coupling which is proportional to one over n. And, um, and if we understand, and so it should be in some sense classical. And the question is whether we can understand the constraints on the interactions of those particles and perhaps a constraint on the spectrum of these particles and so on. Um, this is the type of question that uh, led to string theory, so trying to understand consistent uh, theories of interacting higher spin particles. And it was found that string theory is a solution. Um, I mean, the, the solution was a simple string theory in 26 dimensions. Then people found solutions for uh, string theories in 10 dimensions, super string theories in 10 dimensions. But uh, we still uh, cannot 
have very effective methods for solving the original problem, which was that of uh, a theory in four dimensions, a four dimensional theory of uh, interacting massive higher spin particles. And duals of large n field theories in four dimensions should be uh, such theories. So this is a version of, uh, so this is trying to understand the structure of string theory just purely from the space-time point of view, and from the space-time point of view, what we have is this theory of uh, massive uh, higher spin interacting particles, with or without a massless graviton. So we can have situations where we have a massless graviton, and situations like these ones where we don't have the massless graviton. So st we know string theory is a solution, and we could wonder whether it is the uh, the only solution or which other uh, constraints should be imposed in order to have a single solution. So in the same way that we understand now that general relativity is the simplest uh, solution with massless uh, spin two particles and leading order in derivatives, uh, we'd like to understand whether it, uh, string theory is unique in some way. Or if it's not, then find the most general uh, type of theory of this kind. Now these are, these are very old questions. These are questions from the 60s and it's good to uh, remind oneself of these questions, and I thought you should hear these questions. Um, I, I don't know the answer to these questions. I don't uh, know how to solve them, but maybe some of you will figure out how to solve them. Um, now, l let me emphasize why we care about these questions. So, first of all, trying to understand this problem at the classical level is simpler than the generic uh, quantum problem. Um, and here by classical, again, I mean a weakly coupled at energies under consideration. So a theory um, might be weakly coupled at low energies and become, might become strongly coupled at high energies. But here we're trying to constrain the theory at the energies where it is weakly coupled, right? So, and the claim will be, and we'll see in a specific example later, that there are non-trivial constraints even when the theory is weakly coupled. Um, so, and this is the question we, that I find most interesting. So w one question that I find interesting is what is the, how unique is the structure of string theory? Perhaps can be understood if uh, one understands the solutions of these questions. And finally, another example why this, is, uh, this type of questions is interesting is to consider the holographic dual of a large n uh, theory. So we know that the coupling is small by large n arguments. So the coupling in the bulk theory is, uh, should be one over n. We know the stress tensor gives rise to a massless graviton in the bulk. And the question is, what are its interactions? Are the interactions of between these particles those of a local theory or not? And in fact, the emergence of bulk locality in, uh, in, in these situations is something that should be purely understood at the classical level in the, in the space-time sense. Because we always are always at weak coupling. So even if we vary the Toft coupling, um, the space-time coupling is always one over n and always remains smooth, small when we change the Toft coupling from, from weak to large. Um, so, so understanding better this question of interacting uh, classical higher spin particles, uh, and especially the mass, massive ones, uh, will be important for uh, solving this type of question. Um, so in particular, uh, their interactions are probably constrained to the single particle spectrum of the theory. And an example is if you have uh, higher spin particles that become actually massless, then you have extra gauge symmetries and the structure of the Lagrangian becomes that of the so-called Vasiliev theory. Um, and so that, uh, that's um, one clear example, but as we take these masses and become, and we make them larger, so the masses of the higher spin particles. One question one has is whether uh, the interactions then reduce to the interactions of the Einstein theory or do they remain complicated like those of the Vasiliev theory? So highly non-local as the ones of the Vasiliev theory. Um, so we'll not answer any of these questions. So we'll focus on a simpler question today. That was general motivation and I wanted to emphasize this question so that you have them in mind. Um, but we'll ask a simpler question. We'll consider the simplest interaction we can have in a gravity theory, which is the interaction between three gravitons. So to lead in order, we have three gravitons, and the next correction is the interaction between three gravitons. This uh, has the three-point interaction between gravitons has three different possible Lorentz uh, invariant structures. Um, 
One is the one we get in the Einstein theory, um, but uh, we'll have two others. And we'll argue that uh, the theories that have the other structures actually have a causality problem if no other particles are present, so if we don't have other massive particles. And this causality problem can be solved by adding uh, massive particles with higher spin. Okay. So the plan of this talk is the following. So I will review uh, graviton three-point functions, with all these three structures I talked about before. Uh, we'll discuss a certain high-energy scattering thought experiment. Uh, and we'll see that this thought experiment can be viewed as uh, propagation through certain shock waves. <laughs> and this will lead to certain time delays or time advances which are related to the causality problems. And then we'll discuss how this problem can be solved and why we need uh, higher spin particles to solve this problem. And then we'll end, that, we'll end with a fan application. Um, we, let's consider three-point uh, scattering amplitudes. So we imagine we have three on-shell particles um, and they are interacting at the vertex. And in this situation, if we have particles of spin zero, these uh, amplitudes cannot depend on any non-trivial kinematic invariant. Because, uh, for example, so the, all the KIs uh, obey the Marshall conditions, so they, their squares are zero. Let's say we are having massless particles. And if we take something like K1 plus K2, so we try to form this type of Mandelstam invariant, uh, we'll get that due to momentum conservation, we'll get that it is equal to K3 squared, and it will also be zero. So that we cannot have any uh, non-trivial invariant, and so we have a single constant, which is uh, the coupling constant, and that's it. That changes a bit when we have uh, spin, particles with spin, and so we can have uh, now the polarization vectors of the particles with spin one, and in this case, uh, well, of course, these polarization vectors have to obey uh, certain conditions, and we have the gauge invariant the gauge invariant constraint. But uh, taking into account these constraints, it turns out that there are uh, these uh, two possible structures. Uh, one is the amplitude we get in uh, Jan Mills theory. So this is the familiar three-point amplitude of Jan Mills theory, um, of non-abelian Jan Mills theory. And this uh, amplitude uh, is one which uh, we can certainly write down and it's consistent with uh, the Lorentz symmetry of the theory. Um, and we get it from a term in the Lagrangian of the form F cubed, um, where this is, for example, in non-abelian cases, F cubed. Um, and this, this amplitude relative to the previous one has two extra factors of energy. Okay? Uh, so if we scale the energies uniformly upwards, this one grows faster with energy than this one. Now, if we do the same for spin two, uh, so we can view the polarization back tensor of the spin two particles, so epsilon mu nu, as a product of two polarization vectors of spin one particles. And then we can uh, write uh, three different structures which were the same as that we, we had uh, for spin one. And so we can take the product of two of the ones were, si were similar to the yam mill structure, or one yam mill times the second one, or one yam mill times the F cube one. And this way, we generate three different structure for structures for the graviton three-point functions. And these three different structures, we can get them from terms in the Lagrangian, which are, for example, the first one comes from the Einstein term in the Lagrangian. Uh, the second one come, come from a um, Riemann squared term in the Lagrangian. Uh, that way, we get uh, the second one. And the third one can come from a term which is of the form Riemann cube in the Lagrangian. Of course, all these indices are contracted in a, they're fully contracted. Um, and this, these parameters here uh, have, I've written the parameters here in front of the, these terms in the Lagrangian so that uh, these parameters have dimensions of length. We pulled out an overall one over G Newton. And we're going to assume that uh, G Newton is very, very tiny, uh, <laughs> so the coupling is going to be very small. So there is a factor of square root of G Newton in this three-point amplitude, and this will be very, very small. <laughs> yes? Uh, 
the question is uh, whether in the spin one we need structure constants. Um, yeah, indeed this term is anti-symmetric in the particles. And um, so either we need uh, three different um, U1 gauge fields or we need some structure which is anti-symmetric uh, in the, so if you have a single non-abelian gauge field, then uh, we can write this and there will be an FABC here in this term. Um, but th that, that is a detail, so when we, uh, when we go back to the spin two case, this is fully symmetric in the three particles. And uh, then, uh, so the previous two structures were anti-symmetric in the three particles. These ones are symmetric uh, because we take the product of the two. And so the, the three, all uh, the, the three terms we are having are fully consistent with the symmetries of the, of the gravitons. Now, uh, we have this, uh, we put, we write, write in the coefficients in this way, we have some overall coupling which is very tiny, and then here we have some dimensions of length which are, so have some fixed length, so there are some, some order. Um, and here I wrote this uh, as a square, but uh, this might be imaginary, so the sign can be plus or minus here. Um, and I wanted to choose them in such a way that both have units of length squared. Um, and um, so we have this overall coupling, which is very small. And at distances comparable to these alphas or momenta, which are one over square root of alpha, all these uh, three structures are comparable and would give comparable um, contributions to the scattering amplitude of the three gravitons. Um, but they are all small. So it's not that, uh, since the, so I'm, we can be in a regime where the three are comparable to each other, but they're all three of them are small, okay? So that's uh, why we were taking the, where I was emphasizing this classical limit. So we have a situation where the coupling is small, the theory is classical or close to classical, and, um, uh, but uh, the three structures are contributing. Now in four dimensions we also have, uh, in four dimensions we have an even simpler way to describe this. Um, so in four dimensions the, uh, it's convenient to think about, uh, inst instead of thinking about the polarization tensors, we just think about the helicity of the uh, gravitons and then we can split the amplitudes according to their helicities. And so once we fix the helicities of the external particles, it turns out that the amplitudes are uniquely fixed. And so the plus plus minus and minus plus plus and any other combination of these pluses and minuses, but with, um, with two pluses and one minus or this one, then that gives us the usual amplitude. So the usual Einstein amplitude or in the case of spin one, the Yamel's term. And the plus 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 and minus minus amplitudes give the new ones. In this case, they correspond to the ones that come from the R cubed term in the Lagrangian. And in four dimensions, there is, some, there is a small detail, which is that you could have different coefficients for plus, 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 and plus, plus, uh, minus, minus, minus. Um, and if those two coefficients are different, then uh, we have a parity violating uh, situation. And that corresponds to replacing one of the uh, curvatures in this uh, term by the dual. So we contract with an epsilon tensor and we take the dual one. This will not be important for anything else we do, but I just wanted to mention it. Um, and the R square term that we had in other dimensions, in, in four dimensions, is actually topological. And uh, so this structure is actually not present, so vanish ident vanishes identically in D equal to four. So we can say that in this case, alpha two is equal to zero. Okay, so an example of uh, a theory of this kind is a perturbative string theory. Uh, when G is very tiny and alpha prime is finite, then in this situation, the Planck length is much, much smaller than this than alpha prime. And in fact, uh, one can calculate those uh, coefficients of the three-point functions. And for various uh, string theories, we get various answers. So in the case of the bosonic string, we can uh, get that, um, can you see the pointer? Probably not. Um, so we have alpha two and alpha four are both non-zero and of order alpha prime. And in the heterotic case, well, in, actually in any supersymmetric theory, alpha four has to be zero by supersymmetry. Um, and so the supersymmetric world identities imply that uh, the structure corresponding to alpha four uh, is actually zero uh, and in any dimension. And then the, for the heterotic case, alpha two is non-zero and 
for the type 2 alpha 2 is equal to 0. Yes? Say again. So I'm just asking why up to equals up to one and zero up to five. Yeah, yeah, those are ruled out by supersymmetry. By the supersymmetry of the type two theory. Okay, in so but in string theory there are also massive uh, higher spin particles at this case. So it's not that we get the modification of the three point function and nothing else. We get the modification of the three point function and also some extra massive uh, particles, and in particular particles with higher spin at this scale. So this is just an example. Um, now here I would like to make another comment. <coughs> so the size of the higher curvature corrections, so the size of the term in the Lagrangian that we are considering, is much, much larger than the value suggested by effective field theory as applied to the Einstein action. So when we think of uh, the Einstein action uh, and treat it using the formalism of effective field theory, we would guess a natural term for the R-squared term, which, is, which has a coefficient of order L Planck squared. Um, so in some sense, effective field theory gives you the minimum value that this term should have. That's when we put the cutoff or the theory is just gravity up to the scale uh, proportional to, uh, up to the Planck scale. Um, in some sense, this is the minimum value these terms could have. But in our case, we are considering a situation where L Planck is much, much smaller than alpha. And so this term is much, much larger than the value that is natural in effective field theory. So this is the natural value we get if we uh, take a um, look at the one loop uh, corrections and uh, we put this uh, cutoff at the order of uh, L Planck. Okay, so that's, uh, I wanted to emphasize this because this sometimes causes some confusion when we're talking about this. So for so the values we are talking about are much larger, and indeed in string theory we have corrections to the Einstein action, which are much larger than the ones we would naively expect for based on effective field theory. Okay? So the correction to, um, to the Einstein theory doesn't come at the Planck scale, but it comes at the string scale, which for weakly coupled string theory is much lower. Okay, um, okay so now uh, we'll consider the following thought experiment. So we'll consider uh, two fast-moving gravitons, uh, so scattering between two gravitons at high energies. Um, and by high energies, I mean an energy which is much bigger than the fixed impact parameter. So we're going to do the scattering at fixed impact parameter. So rather than fixing T, we are going to fix the impact parameter. Um, and of course, then T will be of the order of, uh, roughly of the order of B squared, um, one over B squared. Um, but the energies are still, S is not so high that we're in the strongly coupled regime. So we want S to be uh, low enough that we're in the weakly coupled regime, uh, but uh, still much larger than T. So we have a small angle scattering situation. Um, and uh, we will take uh, this impact parameter to be of the order of the new terms that appear in the Lagrangian. So these are um, proportional to these new length scales that we were we are appearing in the classical Lagrangian, or that we are appearing in the ratios between the new amplitude and the old amplitude. So, um, and we can obey all of these conditions. So we can take uh, T to be large enough so that uh, these new terms are comparable, in the three-point functions are comparable to the Einstein term, and at the same time, uh, S, even S, very, very large, so that we can localize these gravitons in the transverse dimensions so that we can talk about this fixed impact parameter configuration. Um, and also such that the theory is weakly coupled. Uh, so let's first discuss this in uh, general relativity. And in order to describe it, let, let's uh, view it as follows. Um, so let's uh, imagine that uh, this first particle is fast moving and it creates uh, a gravitational field. So let's view this as the gravitational field created by the particle. Um, and so we have the flat space metric and then the gravitational field is described by a metric of this form where we have a function h, which is a delta function localized in the x plus direction. So um, the particle here is one is moving to the left, is localized in the x plus direction, is moving at the speed of light. And then uh, we have here uh, function, which is a solution of the Laplace equation in the transverse dimensions. Uh, 
and well with a value, with an amplitude which is proportional to the momentum of this particle number one. And then we'll treat the second particle as a probe moving on uh, on this geometry. Now in the equal to four, this term uh, has a, a log of R or we'll translate in the log of the impact parameter. Um, so the log, the fact that it's a log is related, so it should be a log divided by some other length scale. The other length scale will be some uh, big infrared uh, cutoff. And so there is some dependence on this infrared cutoff, but this will not be important for us. So, um, or we could be in ADS where uh, this log is naturally regulated by the, uh, the, the radius of ADS. Um, so in a situation like this, we, uh, so this is, a, a, this is the same, the drawing of the previous geometry. So we have X plus and X minus, and then uh, at X plus equal to zero, we have the shock that is created by the particle the first particle which is moving along this direction. Um, and now we have the second particle, and as it passes uh, through this shock, it suffers a shift in the x minus direction, which is proportional to this uh, same combination that was appearing in the metric. <coughs> so let me briefly explain why we get this answer. So we go back to the previous metric. And we notice that this metric is very weird. It's discontinuous. Uh, this is a discontinuous metric. Um, so, but we can do a change of coordinates. So a discontinuous uh, change of coordinates that makes the metric continuous at the position where the particle number two crosses. And so once we have the metric written in that continuous form, then we expect that in that form of the metric, then the particle should cross without problem. Okay, should just simply. Uh, cross in a continuous, the trajectory should be continuous in those variables. And then uh, undoing that change of coordinates, uh, we just simply get back to this result. So that's one way of getting this, but there are of course other ways of getting the same answer. Um, this is a, a particular variation on a well uh, known um, effect, which is the Shapiro time delay uh, that leads to the four, four tests of general relativity. So you are probably all familiar with the fact that light uh, going near the sun uh, is slightly deflected. That was one of the tests of general relativity. But in addition to the bending of light, there is also a time delay, a small, uh, some, some time delay. And this time delay, of course, uh, well, has been measured. Um, the effect was noticed uh, only in the 60s and measured later in the 70s and recently with the Cassini sp spacecraft was measured even better. Um, but this is a similar story, except that instead of having the sun at rest, we have a particle that is just moving fast, but it's more or less the same. Um, and by the way, uh, this effect involves a log. Also here, we're in four dimensions. Uh, and in four dimensions, this can be measured. There is no problem with these infrared diversions. Um, so that shows you that it is not an issue. Uh, now in that case, uh, you have the log of the distance to the sun and the infrared cutoff has to do with the distance to the earth or the distance to the, to the, other, the other emitter. Um, so, gra so this is related to the fact that gravity always uh, sort of slows you down. So in fact, um, the null energy condition, um, so that is to say that T plus plus is always positive plus Einstein's equations implies that asymptotic causality is respected. So this is a quite non-trivial aspect of general relativity. Um, so if you have some Minkowski space uh, far away that defines some notion of causality far away, uh, or some ADS far away that defines some asymptotic notion of causality, then by sending signals through the interior, um, you cannot get uh, to the far away region faster than would, you would have gotten if you had remained far, far from the interior region. Okay? Um, that's uh, roughly the way it's uh, formulated by <coughs> Jan Wald, who proved this result. Um, and we will actually impose this as a principle for any theory of gravity. And um, in, in higher dimensions, it's uh, in, in four dimensions, a little subtle to impose this because of this logarithmic uh, term that we discussed before. But in higher dimensions, it's a simpler constraint to impose. And you can see that if you don't impose this constraint, then these little time advances or little violations of causality uh, 
can lead to uh, close time-like curves if you consider two boosted observers. So one, you get a little bit of time uh, violation um, in some reference frame, then you do a boost to, um, and then you consider um, a second one uh, that is boosted relative to the first one, and then, well, I won't, I won't give that in detail, but that is true. Um, also in ADS, imagine that you had an ADS setup where we have the boundary theory, um, and you can send the signal from this point to that point through the boundary. So let's say we send the signal to here, and the fastest way a signal can travel is to get here at some time t. Then you cannot get faster by going through the bulk. Okay? So that's uh, this notion that we are having. If you could get faster going through the bulk, then you would have a violation of boundary causality. So that would be a setup that would be inconsistent with ADS-CFT, for example. So it would be inconsistent with the idea that the dual is a relativist, ordinary relativistic field theory. And in fact, uh, the null energy condition ensures that that can never happen. Um. Now, if now we go and, uh, so that all that was in Einstein, the Einstein theory of gravity. And I said this asymptotic notion of causality is quite a non-trivial constraint on the theory. And in fact, it will be violated in uh, the theories that contain uh, this corrections to the three-point function. So in fact, we can repeat this type of experiment in the theories that have the corrected vertex. And um, in those theories, uh, we find that the, um, the correction has uh, this form. So we get the one is what the result we got in the Einstein theory for the time delay. Uh, but then the other vertices lead to spin-dependent uh, corrections, so spin-dependent um, corrections, and uh, they were proportional to the momentum, and the momentum translates then into a derivative with respect to the transverse position. And so this leads roughly to an expression of this form, and depending on the spins uh, we choose here, uh, we can get plus or minus signs here, and so in regardless of the signs of these coefficients, uh, we will always get some trouble. So we can choose the spins so that we get the time advance instead of a time delay. So we get a situation like this where the signal actually arrives to the faraway position uh, faster than it would have arrived in uh, flat space. Um, so we can have propagation faster than light as seen from infinity. And this uh, then uh, violates this principle of asymptotic causality. And if this was occurring inside ADS, it would violate causality in the boundary theory. Now, this, this whole uh, discussion, uh, I, I described it in terms of the shock waves uh, to connect it a little bit with this uh, Shapiro time delay discussion. Uh, however, it really depends on only on on-shell three-point amplitudes. So if we consider the leading order term in perturbation theory, so the leading order term that contributes to this effect, um, so we'll have the uh, external particles, and um, if we look at the contribution at fixed impact parameter, the only term that can contribute at fixed impact parameter is uh, the term that contains, contains the propagation of a mass, mass well, the, the propagation of an on-shell particle here along this channel. This is the same as saying that uh, the only way we can get a long distance force in uh, in a relativistic theory is by the propagation of a, an on-shell particle with space-like momentum. Okay, okay so uh, those, this is the only diagram that contributes to this uh, point, and since this particle is on-shell, these three-point amplitudes will be on-shell three-point amplitudes. So they were the three-point amplitudes we were discussing before. One curious fact is that um, the, since this momentum is space-like, uh, these three-point functions are, have effectively uh, kinematics which is similar to, the, uh, to that of two time directions. So this space-like direction, we can view it as uh, Q which is time-like in uh, two time directions. And, um, so, and that for that reason, these uh, three-point amplitudes are non-zero. Because with purely Lorentzian kinematics in three plus one dimensions or deep, well, or with only one time, these uh, three-point, on-shell three-point functions will always be zero. Um, Another point is that all other vertices uh, can be neglected. So this causality problem cannot be fixed by adding higher order terms to the Lagrangian. Uh, 
So it's not that we'll add some R to the fourth term and we'll fix this problem and so on. An R to the fourth term might give rise to a coupling of this form, but this coupling does not contribute at fixed impact parameter. <laughs> so uh, if we want to solve this uh, in the classical theory, we really need extra particles that propagate uh, here. So we need extra long range forces that will fix this problem. Um, now then the, the full <coughs> argument to say that there is a problem uh, involves taking this leading order amplitude, which is an effect which is small, and then uh, iterating it so that we generate a causality validation, which is bigger than the quantum uncertainty in the time resolution of the experiment. So that's a small detail. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll add extra massive particles here, but if we have extra massive particles here, we'll also have them uh, in the external particles and the external legs. But uh, we, one can argue that these do not appear, these, these do not appear to solve the problem. So we'll really concentrate on the adding extra massive particles um, along, uh, along this channel. Now, something important is that this, um, the, 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 the overall um, dimensionless uh, um, size of this effect, of the time delay effect, really uh, is proportional to the, to S, to the, to the Mandelstam, to the center of mass uh, mom, uh, energy, square energy, the square of the center of mass energy. Um, that is, so we have one particle which mainly has P plus, very large, and this one has very large P minus, that's S. Um, and the graviton time produced by the graviton grows like S, okay? For of all three terms, it grows like S. So the effect produced by the new particles should also grow at least like S. So if we have some effect which does not grow like S, then it will not be important at high energies and we still have the problem at high energies. In fact, if we, uh, have it here a particle of spin capital S, then the effect will grow like the Mandelstam variable S to the power S minus one. And the way to understand this is that um, here we are, we are propagating a particle um, with some polarizations. Um, and the term that gives rise to this high power of S or to some power of S is a term that will involve a contraction between a P plus here and a P minus here. But here we're just simply having the three point function. So that contraction will not come from the three point function itself, but it must come from a contraction between the P plus and the polarization tensor of this particle. And then we have a polarization tensor of this particle here contracted with this P minus. And then we have a sum over all the polarization tensors. And that, that sum effectively will produce this contraction between P plus and P minus, okay? But how many contractions we will have depend on how many indices this polarization tensor has. So there is a fi fixed number of indices that, uh, well, S indices. So <coughs> the most we can have in the amplitude is uh, Mandelstam e, Mand the variable Mandelstam S to the power spin S, okay? So that's the maximum we can have. And then in the phase shift, because there is another, there is a factor of S which is purely kinematic, I'm not going to discuss, um, that is the minus one. Uh, uh, that's this minus one. Okay, so we need, uh, therefore, um, new particles with spins which are bigger or equal than two. Okay. So we cannot fix this with having scalars uh, being exchanged or spin one particles being exchanged here. Now, uh, let's see uh, what we can do with massive spin two particles. And first we'll, we'll discuss now the four dimensional uh, massive uh, amplitude. So we'll have the red line is a massive spin two particle. And let's consider this massive spin two particle in the rest frame of the massive particle. So this particle can decay into two massless particles. Um, and we can label the, ma the two massless particles where the helicities. So we have helicities which could be plus or minus on each of the two sides. But then let's say this particle uh, decays by emitting this uh, graviton along the C direction, right? Then we look at the conservation of angular momentum around the direction of the graviton. And then 
then we see that this configuration is allowed uh, because the total angular momentum is zero because of the spins. Um, and well, this massive spin two particles could be in a spin zero state around that particular generator, okay? And this one, which would be the, the minus plus amplitude, uh, on the other hand, is not allowed because this would sum up to spin four along that axis. And this massive particle cannot be in a spin four projection on that axis because the maximum projection is two. Um, so only the, the plus plus or plus minus amplitudes are, uh, are allowed uh, because of this angular momentum conservation condition. Now this is, this is the same argument that uh, Weinberg and Witten gave saying that there is no stress tensor in a theory of gravity. So we have theory with massless gravitons. We cannot have a uh, stress tensor. So in their argument, instead of having a massive spin two particles, the role played here by a massive spin two particles in their argument is, was played by the uh, stress tensor at some off-shell momentum, Q, Q squared. Okay. So now uh, we can go back to our experiment and on this side we can fix a, set up a coherent state of particles of a given spin. So in this case um, we will not uh, have a contribution from this spin flip amplitude. So this amplitude in this uh, context uh, will contribute only if the particle, if the spin of this particle is different than the helicity of this particle. So it's when you have a helicity flip. But if we set up a coherent state, the one, the main contribution will come from particles where the spin is not flipping. Um, so in this situation, we will not source the massive gravitons, but we'll still source the ordinary massless graviton. Um, and then uh, when we take the second pro particle propagating here, we'll have the problem that was created by the massless gra exchange of the graviton, but it cannot be fixed by the exchange of these massive particles. Okay. So this shows that the, this problem in four dimensions cannot be solved by massive spin two particles. Now if we have massive spin bigger than two particles, then uh, the phase shift of the second particle as it crosses the shock will be a constant times, we were saying it will grow, la grow like S to some power. And it's a function of P minus. Um, then it's some function of P minus and we like to understand uh, what this function of P minus can be. Well, we, we know that it will be of this form but what can it be if it is a causal theory? So P minus is like the frequency of the wave that we're passing through the shock. And causality implies that we should have something analytic in the upper half plane. So this looks like it's analytic in the upper half plane. But we also expect that it should remain bounded in the upper half plane. Um, also, it, this, uh, we think this is, we haven't derived it completely, but it should be uh, constrained from causality because there are counterexamples. Um, and indeed, if the spin is bigger than one, there will be regions in the upper half plane that where the, uh, this phase shift, so this uh, scattering um, factor, will increase exponentially. Um, so this means that if you have a fixed number of higher spin particles, you will have a problem for, from the particle of higher spin. Um, and so uh, we, could have an infinite number of higher spin particles with delicate cancellations between all of them so that uh, in the end of the day, nothing grows uh, faster than S in the, um, in the phase shift. Um, and indeed, this works in string theory. So in fact, in string, th so string theory is an example where that contains all these particles and this problem is solved in this way. So, and one can check this by taking the four graviton string tree amplitude and take the largest limit then one goes to the impact parameter representation and we find that this uh, phase shift goes indeed grows like S, actually a little lower than S, which uh, has this um, suppressed by this logarithmic term. Uh, but in particular, the higher spin particles do not give something that grows with S, which just simply gives something that does not increase. Um, and indeed, the, this phase shift all also has the right sign uh, to lead to a time delay. In addition, in string theory, something not, not going to be important for what I'm saying is that delta develops an imaginary part due to the possibility of exciting uh, strings along the S channel. So we collide these two gravitons and we create a massive closed string that then can decay and so on. Um, so the typical uh, state will contain this excited particle 
and it's uh, unlikely that you just get only two gravitons back out, and that's why we have this imaginary part. Um, okay, so the conclusion is that um, if the graviton three-point function differs from the one in the Einstein theory, um, then we get the causality problem. And in d equal to four, to fix it, we need an infinite number of massive higher spin particles, and the masses of these particles should be roughly of this form. Um, the actual constraint depends on what you assume about the coupling of the new particles. So if we assume the couplings are all equal, then roughly the masses where uh, they should appear should be of related to the coefficient of this three-point function of the gravitons uh, through this formula. In d bigger than four, uh, in principle, we might be able to solve this with a, an infinite number of massive spin two particles. We haven't shown that it is impossible to do this, but uh, so maybe you could do that. We don't know that for sure. So, but in any case, you need an infinite number of new particles, whether spin two or higher. And in four dimensions, they have to have particle masses, uh, spins strictly bigger than two. Um, now, let's, let's try to understand where these corrections uh, come from in string theory. Uh, just to understand the intuition for why we would expect to see a problem and why we expect to see a result of this kind. So if the uh, graviton is a, an extended object, then uh, when this is the graviton, it contains, let's say, two little partons. <laughs> and when it crosses through the shock, let's say each parton gets, uh, has a phase shift that is similar to the one we get in Einstein theory. But one crosses at one position and the other one crosses at a different position in the transverse directions. And so we'll get the final phase shift, which will contain uh, the second derivatives, which were of the kind that we find in the correction to the vertices. So in some sense, you can view uh, the correction to the vertices as some indirect evidence of the compositeness of the graviton. Um, of course, if the graviton was composite, indeed, when you get to situations where these two terms are equally important, it means that the graviton got really split into two, uh, two very different pieces. And so the graviton can be excited, and this is related to the presence of higher spin particles. So everything I said here was uh, qualitative, but it's the intuition that allows you to understand why uh, these two facts are connected. Now let me discuss now an application for uh, the ADS duals of uh, large end gauge theories. Or, um, so in this case, we have three different structures for the stress tensor three-point functions. So here we have the, the stress tensor three-point functions on the boundary, and they are dual in the bulk to uh, graviton three-point amplitudes. Um, and in general, we can have uh, these three different structures. If we have supersymmetry, we can have only two of them. Um, so those uh, three-point functions also uh, determine the conformal anomaly coefficients, a and c. So the trace of the stress tensor is not zero, but is equal to uh, the vial uh, the vile tensor on the boundary theory plus the Euler uh, invariant, the only, the, the Euler density in the boundary theory, and the two coefficients are called C and A conventionally. Now, if the bulk theory is described by Einstein gravity, then we get that A is equal to C. Um, now, if the bulk theory contains a correction to the Einstein term, in particular, let me just say the theory is supersymmetric, so we only have this correction. Uh, then uh, a minus c over c is going to be proportional to this alpha two correction, to the term proportional to r squared. Um, so it's the size of this length in units of the radius of ADS. That determines the deviation from the Einstein action. Um, now, in the we can now apply the analysis we did before to the uh, region around this vertex, so this nearly flat space region around the vertex, and we will get um, w the, the condition we derived before that we have uh, particles of uh, spins bigger or equal than two uh, at uh, this order of masses uh, will imply uh, together with uh, this condition between the dimension and the, and the mass of ADS yes, that the deviation between C and A uh, has to be uh, lower, so the, the values of the three-point function has to be lower than one over the dimensions of the operators which have spin bigger or equal than two, okay? So this is a, a relationship between um, 
between cor correct deviations of, the, of some coupling in the action to the spectrum of the theory, okay? So if uh, all the higher spin particles all have very high masses, then A and C cannot differ too much from each other. Now, it would be nice to derive this from the conformal bootstrap. So recently there was a lot of progress in understanding better the conformal bootstrap. Um, and many of the techniques there used uh, the external states which were spinless. And so here we spin played an important role in these considerations. And it is uh, likely that uh, by doing similar things to the things that were done with particles or, or operators with spin, you might get extra extra constraints. Okay, now let me discuss a fun application of this. So um, let's uh, scatter three gravitons at 14, uh, 10 to the 14 GeV, okay? Let's consider a 10 to the 14 GeV graviton collider. <laughs> now, H during inflation, so the Hubble scale during inflation could be this high if this bicep uh, experiment is correct. Um, we don't know whether it's correct or not, but if the bicep signal is primordial, uh, then uh, H could be this high. Maybe it's a little lower, but it could certainly be this high. Um, now, gravitons get uh, produced by inflation with energies which are proportional to H, to the Hubble scale during inflation. Um, the gravitons are weakly coupled. In fact, the two-point function of gravity waves uh, is of the form H squared over M Planck, and that is uh, a measure of the effective coupling um, because these are the quantum fluctuations. It's telling us directly the effective value of H bar during inflation, and this is definitely less than 10 to the minus nine, whether the Weiss experiment is correct or wrong. Just the fact that we haven't already seen gravity waves tells us that uh, it should be less than this. So we are dealing with a very weakly coupled theory of gravity during inflation, okay? Now, these gravitons can collide. So we can have these gravity waves and they can collide with each other. And so they can, these collisions can affect the, the <coughs> statistics of these gravity waves and the statistics of the gravity waves we see in the sky. So in fact, uh, the, there can be non-Gaussianities in the gravity wave uh, distribution or spectrum of primordial <coughs> tensor fluctuations. And in fact, you can calculate those. So um, in a purely Gaussian theory, the three-point function uh, would be zero. Um, so th these three-point functions are ordinarily computed in momentum space, where you take the, um, you, you look at waves with specific wavelengths and you consider this correlation, this three-point correlation functions. So by translation symmetry, the sum of the three wavelengths should be zero. The three momentum vectors should be zero. These are momentum vectors in three spatial dimensions. And um, then you get that the three, this three-point function is a function of this triangle um, and also a function of the polarizations of the, uh, of the gravity waves we are looking at. Um, now, uh, relative to, so the size of the three-point functions relative to the size of the two-point functions uh, is small, is proportional to the coupling. The coupling is H over M Planck, as we saw that was small. And in the Einstein theory, we get a particular shape here. So I, I won't write it down, but it's no, a known shape. Um, that is a function of the three momenta. Now it turns out that the symmetries of the sitter, uh, the symmetries of the sitter space, so if we approximate inflation by the sitter space, then we have, um, we have the scale invariance of the fluctuations has to do with the, the the time translation symmetry of the sitter space. And we also have the conformal invariance of the uh, wave function of the universe is, uh, is related to the isometries of the sitter space, all the isometries of the sitter space. And those uh, allow only uh, these two possible shapes. So that is, we know assumption of what the dynamics of the theory is. We have only these two possible shapes. Um, and if we had a term in the Lagrangian that was of the form R cubed, then we could generate certainly this shape with a size which is proportional to the this length scale in units of the radius of the sitter space, so the Hubble radius during inflation. So all this just follows from the symmetries. Um, 
I mean, many other uh, properties of uh, the inflationary perturbations just uh, that have been observed so far follow just purely from the symmetries of uh, the sitter. Okay, so we had this overall coupling and this is allowed um, in principle. And so imagine that this allowed term is actually uh, measured in uh, the gravity wave spectrum. Um, and so if that was measured, then it means that we have something like uh, string theory during inflation, okay? Because this is a term that was present during inflation. So if this coefficient is of order one or perhaps slightly less than one, so but still measurable, uh, then we had that implies through the previous arguments that we needed to have higher spin particles um, during inflation. Now the converse is not true, so that means, so the absence of this term doesn't mean that uh, string theory is ruled out. Um, because we can have string theories with no correction to the graviton three-point function at the Hubble scale. In fact, most of the models that people discuss for string inflation, like the Ibrahim inflation or monodromy inflation, et cetera, are of this form, with no, uh, no sizable corrections of uh, the three-point graviton at the Hubble scale, because in those models, they basically come from compactifying the 10-dimensional theory. Um, we saw there were no corrections in 10 dimensions. In fact, in order to have uh, a term like this of order one, then you need the string scale to be, um, the, the string length to be comparable to the radius of the sitter space during inflation. So it's not the, the type of model people ordinarily look at. Uh, it's perhaps not the simplest model building scenario because it's difficult to analyze such uh, string theories. But if a string theory back, uh, so inflationary model like this existed, and had the signature, it would be really drastic uh, way to cons confirm uh, or to, to see uh, evidence for string theory. Because this is a structure we cannot, uh, we, we've argued we cannot generate it in effective field theory with, uh, part with massless gravity plus ordinary particles. Um, okay, so conclusions are that uh, these deviations of uh, the graviton three-point function from the Einstein theory um, are inconsistent with uh, causal uh, field theories with particles uh, with spin less, less than one in four dimensions. Um, and it signals the existence of new higher spin particles uh, if uh, the theory is weakly coupled. In the, and in the case of uh, the gravity wave three-point function inflation, the theory is definitely weakly coupled. And if seen, it would be an indication of structures like, uh, in string, like we have in string theory. Okay, thank you. <laughs>